Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Lutheran Church of the Lakes, and I guess uh, a Merry Christmas slash Happy New Year. Yeah. yeah, you get to pick which one. Yeah, it's fun. Choose your own adventure. Welcome today, and it's good to have you with us. And today we are, well, I'm throwing an audible, sorry, because initially we have a gospel reading that's just one verse long, so if you blink, you will miss it. And then I started reading and realized I wanted to do the next five verses. So you're going to deal with me as I talk about Simeon. Because I was reading it and just, ah, uh, Simeon, what a cool story. Where he holds the Christ baby and then he proclaims this beautiful thing. And then it hit me. The baby he's holding is there to die. Not, not just for no reason and not yet as a baby, but came for us so that we wouldn't die. And that is a Christmas message. That is a great Christmas gift that we are going to talk about. But I ask that you would please, uh, at this point, stand and join me as we begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins. And cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We confess. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O come, O Has bared his holy arm 
before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O God, our Maker and Redeemer, you wonderfully created us, and in the incarnation of your Son, yet more wondrously restore our human nature. Grant that we may ever be alive in Him, who made himself to be like us, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I've heard about this baby boy who's come to earth to bring us joy, and I just want to sing
The first reading is from Numbers, the sixth chapter. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Galatians, the third chapter. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ and put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Like I said, don't blink. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, Lord. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated, and I invite the children to come forward for the children's message.
So like I said originally, I wanted to use that one verse lesson, and yes, that is actually a lesson, just one verse, to talk about Jesus' name. And then I started reading the context, and I really liked the next few verses which come after it about Simeon. So forgive me, I'm switching topics to Simeon today. Simeon was a devout man at the temple. He was promised by God to live until his eyes gazed upon God's salvation. So he knows he's going to be kicking around until he sees the Messiah. Well then, of course, Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to name him. To give him the name Jesus, which means God will save, which was very apt, and to come to circumcise him at the temple. And of course, as they do, they bring a sacrifice for Mary's firstborn son. And of course, at the temple, this devout man, Simeon, meets them and holds the Christ child in his arms. Now at this point, whether they know it or not, the light of the world, the light of the Gentiles, and the glory of Israel is right there. The entire plan to redeem God's people and his world is in that swaddling clause. God's Son has already come and become incarnate in flesh, and now Mary is bringing her Son to the temple, to the house of God, where in just a few years he will return. But right now he is brought, according to the custom of the Torah, as is the duty of the parents, and they meet Simeon. And Simeon is there simply waiting. He's waiting to see what God had told him. He will see the salvation of the world. Luke describes him this way. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. <clears throat> Simeon's job was to wait. To just hang out. And upon seeing the Christ child and holding just that little days old boy in his arms, Simeon immediately knows. He immediately knows as his eyes gaze upon the child that this is it. And so he says, my eyes have seen your salvation. That you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now, we've heard from the angels in the fields, right? The ones that scared the snot out of the shepherds. They came, and then they told the shepherds, go find him. And then the shepherds found Jesus. And they praised him and just wondered in awe. And now we hear the gospel proclamation of Simeon as people continue to welcome their Savior into the earth. Is gospel proclamation he as Simeon's song, as it's come to be known, was, I think I want to consider it right now to be an announcement of the beginning of the end, that his waiting is over and the end has arrived. Things are going to heat up really fast. Luke wants us to know that the Savior is in the world, so just in the next chapter, just a few verses away in chapter 3, we are already at Jesus' baptism. We see the beginning of his ministry. Now he's resisting Satan in the wilderness. He's healing people, bringing people from the dead, giving sight to the blind. Man, things are moving fast all of a sudden. He went from being just a baby to a man. Where in the world did 30 years of Jesus' life go? Where's the parts about the teenage awkward stages and all that? Well, let's keep in mind that for Luke and Simeon and all the people of Israel, they want to jump to the chase. Because this has been a long, long wait. I mean, consider how Simeon, and for that matter, all of Israel has been hearing the prophets. They've been mostly believing the promise of God, and they've been waiting for the Christ. Always waiting. I mean, it's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years since their father Abraham was called and given the promise. And even before him, it was hundreds and hundreds of years before that when Eve received the promise of a son who would come. 
It's been a long wait, guys. In fact, waiting was so important to the Israelites that it kind of became part of their DNA. In fact, God instructed the parents and grandparents, tell your kids and grandkids that they are too waiting just like you. Tell them what they're waiting for, the Messiah. Tell them to wait. He's coming. It was part of being an Israelite to wait. And now, guess what? Simeon says, redemption's here, everyone. The waiting is over. Let's jump to the chase. And that's why Luke is all of a sudden talking about who this Jesus guy is and what he is doing. So that he can prove, without a doubt, the wait is over. Now, I don't know about you guys, but for me, waiting is really, really hard. I'm going to assume it's true for you, and that if it's not, well, I don't believe you. <laughs> waiting for something to find out that it's really, really lame? Oh, that's unbearable. <clears throat> Thankfully, the Christ child did not disappoint. That's what Luke is getting at. Don't worry, guys. It wasn't a lame duck. It worked. This is the guy. Because for a long time, Simeon had been waiting for the consolation of Israel, just like Israel had. So when he gives these tidings of comfort and joy, he's giving this proclamation to a people in bondage. They don't want to get their hopes up for nothing. I mean, think about it. Israel's history, well, let's start with Egypt. How did Egypt go? It started off pretty well, and then it got really rocky as they became literal slaves to the Egyptians. Well, it got a little better. God took them out of Egypt, gave them some land, and whoops, they're already forgetting God and making golden calves to worship. They're back into bondage again to false gods. Well, now, after 40 years, they're in Israel, and what do they find? Hey, the people already living here have gods. Close enough. Always, always in bondage for new bondage. Finding new master after new master. They've been waiting for someone to free them. And yet... Simeon points out that it's not just the Israelites. He doesn't say this is only for Israel. He says it's for the whole world. Because the whole world is in bondage as well. The Apostle Paul calls it sin. Very simply, he says we are slaves to sin. And under this master there is but one ending. The pain of death. Simply, the wages for people who work sin are death. So all of the people in the world, us included, open your hands for the paycheck of death. That's what we have. But in Christ, our sentence was served. He ponied up, handed over his life, and paid the death that we deserved, so that our death will only ever be but temporary. The chains of sin are rooted deep in hell, and yet he came and sawed him and smashed him and broke him with hammers. So that even if our bodies die, the bondage to sin is broken. Death does not hold us. And Luke points that out too. He even says at the end of this gospel, Jesus rises from the dead so that we will too. That is our hope. Those are the tidings of comfort and joy that we hold in our hearts. Waiting for Christ does not disappoint. Just as Simeon was not disappointed when he held the baby who these youth so kindly told us don't do a whole lot very well. He could have easily have held the baby and said, oh, a baby, but instead he rejoiced because it's Jesus. And all of Israel was waiting for this moment. For when Christ would be brought to the temple. Luke writes that Mary and Joseph brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, normally, a Jewish family would try and afford a lamb to be sacrificed for this instance. Maybe it was the poverty or some other explanation that they instead went with the cheaper option. But I don't think Luke's gospel likes to speak in coincidences. Instead, Luke really likes to point out God's ironies that he built into the Christ story. 
And so, yeah, Joseph and Mary may have come in a humble state and have gone to the temple without a lamb of the field, but we know that right there in Mary's arms, with these people, is the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. No, no coincidence, I don't think. Mary and Joseph have come to keep the Torah, but in God's divine plan, they are fulfilling it in such an incredible way by bringing Jesus home to his Father. And, and on a level that I don't think they could comprehend yet, no lamb was necessary because they brought the Lamb of God. And that's it. That is what creation, that is what Israel and Simeon, that is what everything is waiting for, for Jesus to be here. And so Simeon's song of celebration is one of such joy. The fulfillment is over. The waiting is done. The Messiah is here. But in many ways, what Simeon says goes against expectations. I think even Mary and Joseph maybe didn't expect what's to come. See, we've kind of got this thing where Christmas and even Christmas sermons uh, are, to fear, are to feel floaty, like a, like a picture with an angel and a talking camel and Mary and Joseph smiling happily over their newborns. But instead, Simeon is proclaiming God's goodness for the literal sacrificial lamb that is baby Jesus, for the person of Christ. That's the point of the waiting. That's what the good news. I hear it often that Jesus is the gift of Christmas, the best gift, and that's true. But I think we can get more specific. See, because there are a lot of people who would say Jesus was a great teacher. What a gift to humanity, right? Oh, he taught us how to love. And there are some people that would say, oh, he's a magician, a prophet, maybe. What a gift for my faith. No, no, we can get far more specific than that. Jesus is the Christmas gift because he is the final sacrifice. If he came to be a teacher or a prophet, we're still up a creek. But because he came to be a sacrifice to pay our wages of sin, which is death, he is the Christ. More than a prophet, far more than a teacher, though he is those things. And that has always been Jesus' destiny. To be the sacrificed lamb of God. Simeon, with all his praise, couldn't even stop from saying this. He turns and without a stutter says to Mary and Joseph, the boy's parents of all things, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many. And for a sign that is destined to be spoken against. Jesus is to be spoken against. Sacrifice is choosing to be rejected so that others may be accepted. Jesus was rejected so that we may be accepted again by God. And don't think Jesus didn't know that this was his destiny. In chapter 20, he himself is going to say, The stone that the builders rejected, me, has become the cornerstone. The stone on which everything is built. Jesus came to be rejected to the very point of death so that we might be accepted into life with God. All of that waiting, all of the waiting from Adam and Eve and their descendants, Israel, from Simeon, from the world, for Jesus to be so utterly rejected. Now, Simeon may not have expected truly how much conflict would come of this baby boy in his arms. He did give such a beautiful pronouncement of the faith. But even according to Simeon, and this had to have hurt or be confusing at the very least, he tells his own, Jesus' own mother Mary, that Jesus will be like a sword through her own soul. Of course, what mother wants to see what will happen to her son? Even natural blood relationships are washed away in the blood of the Lamb as he makes a new family of people through his blood, as he makes a new people of God through his sacrifice. And so, yes, Simeon waited. He waited and he waited and he waited. Israel waited as well. And now for us, 
We have him. We have the Christ, no longer a child, but a man who died and rose for us. He didn't stay dead. And we don't wait for life. We have it now. And yet we still wait for the final consolation of the world, but we don't wait with dismay, we don't wait without hope, and we don't wait without knowledge of the Messiah. We know who he is. He is Jesus the Christ, who has bought you eternal life. He is the Lamb of God. Now I pray, may God, who has carried you all into life in Christ, help us to faithfully wait for his return, just as Simeon so faithfully waited. Amen. I invite you to please stand and join me as we confess our faith in the Christ through the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, out of God, light of light. Very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for our sin and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again. Father, we 
are people who are not waiting for Jesus. We are blessed by him. We are given life in him, and he has died and redeemed us and paid the price. And yet, Father, we are still waiting for him to come to put a final end to all of the pain and all of the toil and all of the difficulties that sin has made in this world. So on one hand, Lord, we thank you, and on the other, we ask him to come back quickly. And in the meantime, Lord, care for us, protect us, and, and help us to proclaim the good news that Christ is coming and has come to those who do not know him yet. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we pray for those who are still waiting for healing. Please offer them healing in this life for all of the many people who we know who are dealing with cancer, strokes, hurts, pains, surgeries, and so much more. Help us to have doctors and physicians and nurses and caretakers that can be a blessing to all of us, that we would know a taste of the healing that is coming when your Son returns. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we pray for those people who have lost loved ones this year and who are, who are now dearly waiting for the resurrection when they will get to see them again whole in body, living and celebrating life with your Son. Please help our grief to become joy. Help us to depend on you and the promise of new life in your Son forever. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we ask that you would grant us a blessed life as a congregation, but also as individuals this coming year. Bless our families, bless our people, bless our friends, and all that we do that it would be to your will and to the service of the growth of your kingdom. Please give us a unity of spirit and mission that we would seek the lost and care for the saved. Let your love for the world be our love shown throughout our communities. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, in these coming months of the next year, please protect all of us. Keep us healthy. Keep us safe. We ask you to protect and guide our country and its leaders as well, that they would follow your will. And also protect all of your faithful Christians, both in our communities here, in Michigan, in our country, and also around the world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Father, we pray to you, as your Son, Jesus Christ, teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. We join together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In communion, Jesus comes to us in a mystery. He says that the bread is also his body, the wine is also his blood. Jesus gives us the promise that his body and his blood are present here to give us forgiveness of sins and peace among his church. That promise was given to us when our Lord, Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Welcome to the Lord's table.
blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to eternal life. Go in his peace. Amen. Holy Lord, we praise you and we thank you for giving us your body and your blood. May it keep us in true faith and peace until you return to restore us and the whole world. With all of creation, with all believers, we praise you and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
gracious to you, the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.